sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. Today's workshop, we'll hear about the dark and devious world of self-radicalization and misinformation, learn how to spot the bots, sniff out fake news, and find credible sources of information. I can tell you that our speakers today are both amazing librarians. They are treasure hunters and information finders. They are both published in their fields, both nationally and internationally. They love to work with students. I'm sure some of you have worked with them before. And I can tell you from personal experience working with these two for many years that they are some of the best detectives you will ever meet. No shady information will be getting by these two, let me tell you. Uh, Emily Brown is the coordinator of library research and instruction here at Bristol, and Susan Susan Mort, our research and instruction librarian. Please welcome Emily Brown and Susan Susan Mort. Thank you. Thank you. Just to let our audience know, this is a PG-13. There is mild profanity and violence. Um, we uh, also... Elizabeth Sinclair. Great, yeah, go oh. ahead. So just when you guys were coming in, there was a montage of different news stations. And uh, that's actually owned by Sinclair Broadcast Company. They actually own 193 stations in over 100 markets across the United States. That's over 40% of American households. They're extremely conservative and actually struck a deal with Jared Kushner back when Trump was running for president. Um, and so again, this whole sets the tone, right? Um, we also want to point out that we have until 1215 to try to cover some of the misinformation that's out there on the internet, but by no means can we cover it all. Um, the topics we chose to concentrate on, we felt are of um, you know, some extreme need right now. So as we go through, you might think, oh, what about this thing, what about that? But at the same time, all of the topics we're going to cover could be covered in their own 50-minute lecture, okay? So keep that in mind. So here we have a quote, okay? And this is kind of reflective about how people get their information. So the question was, from where did you receive, research, develop your beliefs? And the answer, to no one's surprise, is the internet, of course. You will not find the truth anywhere else. So what is fake news? We hear this all the time, um, but quite honestly, this goes back to history. I actually teach history here, and I can tell you, even under the ancient Egyptians, we were given propaganda back then, right? The, who writes history? It's the conquerors, it's the winners. Um, and it really kind of, uh, yellow journalism, which is a term around 1898 during the Spanish-American War, with the advent of the telegraph, right? If you think of the internet, the telegraph is kind of similar to that, where information was able to spread rapidly. So we were getting information right from the front, whereas before we had to wait months, you know. And so basically, yellow journalism terms started to appear. And what that meant is it didn't matter if it's accurate. It had to be fast and it had to be sensationalist. So how many of you think you were exposed to fake news in the last election cycle? Good. Very conservative. Yeah. So 
the fact is that 248 million American adults were exposed to fake news during the last election. Now, this is something that continues in our social media atmosphere today. Right? So if you didn't see it in 2016, you have probably seen it by now. This is roughly 88% of us in America. So back in the fall of 2018, um, Project Information Literacy, which is a nationwide organization of um, librarians, uh, Dr. Allison Head did a survey with over 100 colleges and over thousands of college students wanting to know exactly where they got their news from. And overwhelmingly, her results showed that 89% of college students get their um, news from social media. What was even more interesting, I found, was that the top three social media sites were Facebook, Snapchat, and YouTube. Now, my question is, Snapchat? Like, does the newscaster have like a cute little bunny in nose and like little flowers around their head? I, I can't fathom that. We're um, not old. <laughs> I don't do Snapchat. <laughs> um, but it's amazing, right? And so I took this, so this came out in the fall of 2018, so the spring 2019, we both decided that we wanted to roll it out with some of our uh, college success seminar classes. These are introductory classes, and a lot of faculty will have us come in and talk about library resources, but we have great faculty that allow us to do our harebrained schemes, and uh, they let us roll this out. And I actually um, used her survey, and I had the students do it prior before the class, and overwhelmingly, it's funny because we didn't really look at the data again until we started this presentation. So I went back and looked at project information literacy data set, and I looked at what we pulled up, and it was remarkably the same. So we also found that 88% of our students get their news from social media. And what was more astounding is it mirrored exactly Dr. Head's findings, is that the three top social media sites are Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. Do you guys feel that that mirrors your experiences pretty well? Yeah, I'd say so too. Except for I'm on Twitter and it evidently didn't make it to the top three. I was astounded by that, to be I honest mean. with you. So the main point and one of the main themes we have here today is that information is power. If I control what you believe, I can control how you vote, how you talk to your family on Thanksgiving Day, I can control almost anything. And this is the, the information atmosphere that we're living in now, right? Those of us who consume information and those of us who realize that information can be molded and um, messaged in order to get people to act in a certain way. Okay, So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, is how powerful information actually is. So it's everywhere. We know it's on social media. So for example, with our statistics here, we have Facebook had 140 million bots, Twitter had 23 million bots, Instagram 27. Um, so when we talk about bots, and we're not even talking about trolls yet, these are just bots. So I'm using these words, bots and trolls. Can you guys tell me what a bot is? Anybody? Yes. It's like, like an automatic sort of AI-ish kind of thing that you comment on. How about a troll? Someone who seeks this uh, so discontent. Yeah, perfect. Yes. So you guys are exactly right. So trolls are essentially human actors who are out there to sow discontent. I like the way he said that. Um, who are out there purposely to kind of get people riled up, get angry, you know, all of these things. That's what trolls do. Um, Bots are essentially algorithms, right? So they go out and they retweet or promote hashtags in order to drive a specific message. So it's rather interesting that, you know, we always hear Russia in the news. But just this past spring, Vladimir Putin actually passed laws in his country regarding um, Fake, spreading fake news, which is, as we know, a little bit laughable because they're probably one of the biggest spreaders of it globally. Um, Russia can now ban information that it decides it considers fake within its own borders. Um, and it's while they're going on spreading falsehoods, again, to many different countries, including the United States. As a matter of fact, the United States and the um, European Union accused Russia of spreading misinformation. And Facebook itself said many of the accounts spread um, were on social media as long as, as well as Twitter as well. And I think I have a statistic. Um, yes, so Russia, Facebook testified that about 126 million Facebook users had seen Russian-linked content, 
Twitter found more than 3,800 accounts linked to the IRA, which we'll talk about. And um, about 1.4 million US users have seen Kremlin propaganda. So before we move to the next slide, what political ideology do you feel that Russian propaganda backs up more, conservative or liberal? Conservative. 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 So everybody think, how many think conservative? All right, how many think liberal? All right. All right. So the interesting thing is it's both. Everywhere. Everywhere. So what you see here is a mixture of memes that the um, intelligence community was given a report. And so what do we see here? And I realize that the, the screen is a little bit fuzzy, but can you tell me some of the themes that you're seeing in these, these memes? These are, are pages here? that you can like. Right, right, sorry. My bad. I deleted my Facebook. <laughs> yep, Shout ahead. it out. Right, so like blue lives matter, right? What else do you see? The South will rise again. That I heard you what? Black lives, Black Black lives, lives matter. matter, blue right? lives matter, yep. So this is their strategy, is to divide us. So how many of you remember the shooting at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Research showed that immediately following the breaking news of the shooting in that in that school that Russian bots were promoting both Second Amendment rights as well as gun control hashtags. Okay, what's the point here? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? Divide exactly. and conquer. That's exactly what they want. Right. This is not, Russia is not our friend, right? This is not a, a changed world where suddenly this is our, our friend, so right? So this is actually a whole agency and I just also want to point out with these screenshots that these are sponsored. So that means they're paying Facebook to make sure that you see their content. Right. So the Internet Research Agency was set up essentially as a Kremlin-run organization. It existed in Russia in order to spread misinformation. How many of you guys have heard of Robert Mueller? All right, so do you remember when he indicted some Russians? This is who it was. This is who they As indicted. A matter of fact, just to read part of the lawsuit, it says basically, um, Defendants posing as U.S. persons and creating false U.S. personas operated social media pages in groups designed to attract U.S. audiences. These groups and pages, which address divisive U.S. political and social issues, falsely claimed to be controlled by U.S. activists, when in fact they were controlled by the defendants. Defendants also used stolen identities of real U.S. persons to post on organization-controlled social media accounts. Over time, those social media accounts became defendants' means to reach significant number of Americans for purposes of interfering with the US political system. You know what they did too? They would create events and Americans would show up to them, right? So an event was organized in Russia, posted to Facebook pages in the United States, and our citizens, we, would show up to these events. I mean, that is the impact that the Internet Research Agency had. So these are just some examples, and so you know, be wary of whenever you're on social media, these are some of the things you can look at. So these are some examples of Russian trolls. Okay, we have the first one is at 10 GOP, which represents Tennessee uh, Republicans, and this actually is a real organization that was, um, that the, not this one. Uh, not this one, the Internet Research Agency actually overtook the Twitter handle. And so people not knowing were liking this page and retweeting stuff thinking it came from this Tennessee Republican Party. Um, the other one is a woman, just a Pamela Moore, underscore Moore 13. So this is how they hide. They make it look like the either organizations that we actually like, or it makes it look like they're actual American citizens. Right. And these had major impacts, right? We're not just talking one or two followers, we're talking 100,000 followers or more. Right. So for example, like, so before this got shut down by Twitter, they had 100,000 followers, but what was more startling and a little scary is that the people who followed them are called influencers, right? So these are people who have millions of followers. So people like Michael Flynn, Roger Stone, they're retweeting this stuff. And then their millions of followers are retweeting this stuff. And then their followers are retweeting this stuff. And it just goes on and on and on. Any questions so far? All right. So what's the point, right? The point of the Internet Research Agency is to destroy Western democracy. I have three states here where Russia infiltrated, posted misinformation, and essentially tried to disrupt 
elections as well as institutions. So in Ukraine, Russia took a very aggressive stance where they essentially started to hack voting machines. They got into their infrastructure and caused blackouts, right? They even, in some cases, poisoned some major politicians. Right? Then we see the Brexit elections, which were also influenced by Russian misinformation. And we've seen that here. Right? So in this country, we know during the 2016 election that Russian misinformation was a major factor. And as we know from Mueller's testimony this summer, it continues to this day. And their point is to destroy our democracy. So there's also something that has started to happen is that the political parties have realized how valuable memes actually are, right? So political parties have created meme machines where essentially they've hired young internet savvy people to create memes to reach out to the younger generations, right? They tend to be tongue in cheek, they tend to be snarky, they tend to be the kinds of posts that young people might be more attracted to. So these are meant and created by political parties in order to encourage you to vote for specific political parties or political agendas. So now it's not just somebody sitting at home creating these things, they are being created by political parties as well. New job outlook. <laughs> I'm gonna just create political memes. So, so Facebook is trying to combat it, right? They took a lot of heat, Mark Zuckerberg, and so what they're doing now, if you've noticed, if you go and share a meme, or any kind of post, Facebook is actually covering it up, saying this is fake and here's why. And what they're doing is they're linking it to two of my favorite sites. One is PolitiFact, right? One a Pulitzer for its fact checking, and the other one is Snopes, right? And so basically it's trying to get people to spread this misinformation because people just read it, oh, I agree with that. Who needs clean air? And I'm gonna share it immediately without even bothering to check if it's actual fact worthy. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, one of the reasons I don't like going on Facebook is I feel, as a librarian, I'm forever putting out fires, fact-checking my friends' fake political memes. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is, it's just Facebook. And we know our younger users, our younger population, they're not using Facebook. They're using Instagram and Snapchat, and they're not doing it yet. So there's no filter, nothing telling you that what you're seeing is actually fake. And now we'd like to play a short PSA by President Obama. This is where the mild profanity comes in. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right. <coughs> ben Carson is in the sunken place. Or, how about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. <laughs> now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but <laughs> someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely <laughs> on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. Stay woke, bitches. But that's scary. What that's absolutely scary that we can take people and manipulate them and actually... Well, hold on. Right. What did you just see? Do you guys even know what you saw there? What was it's it? Called. Go for it. That's yes. exactly what it's it is. It's a deep fake. So deep fake is actually a artificial intelligence program. And um, it's essentially studied Obama's movements, right? So as he, like, they put his videos into a machine learning software, and the software studied how he talked, how he moved his head, how he used his hands. So that video of Obama never happened. It never existed, right? It was completely AI generated. And that's what's called a deep fake. Just, now, just an aside, we were gonna try to use this technology, thankfully for our president, 
And we were gonna make her say like, Susan and Emily are like the best librarians best. in the world. <laughs> So the, the nice thing is, is thankfully this kind of software isn't is as easily available, but as we all know, technology moves so fast, right? Who knows in five years where this technology might be, in the, might be an app on your phone. Exactly, and so this is essentially considered one of the biggest threats to our public discourse, right? If you can't even believe the video that's in front of your face, because it used to be that video told the truth, right? This is what we would go to as documentary evidence. But with deep fakes, you can really manipulate anybody to say anything. And they do have an app where you just swap a face. I don't know if you saw that. Um, the person was able to swap their face with Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic. So it's, it's getting there, it's getting there. Um, so one of the things you want to keep in mind when this stuff happens, if it's the night before the election and you see some scandalous video of President Trump accepting a bribe, what can you do? Because that's right, it's going to fall on you, right? And the nature of these videos and these memes and this misinformation is to be spread and to spread quickly. Right? So the CIA has even said that watch out for this. Watch out for it on the night of an election or as something bigger is happening to distract or to change the narrative. One of the things that I tell my students all the time is that nobody's going to be sitting over your shoulder being like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. This is gonna fall on you guys, right? At the end of the day, you're the ones who are going to have to make sure you're consuming correct information. So how do we spot the imposters? Do any of you guys have any tips and tricks? Do you know when you go on Twitter or Facebook what you look for? What are some signs? Do you not look? That's a valid question or a valid answer. To see if they're paid or promoted. That's a good one. A Absolutely. Good one. I didn't even think of that one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yep. Trying to look for like good looking at the title, see if it's like clickbaity or if it doesn't like it doesn't look like a silly bill, right? Okay, right? good. good. Yeah. Somebody that follow a lot, like see if like act like differently. That's something that like, follow a lot. Yeah. 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 True. Yes. Well, I take it with face value unless I do more research behind it. Right. Good. So a lot of things too, when you look at these bots or these trolls, a lot of the times like the pictures are kind of contrived or photoshopped. Um, you can see that, especially with Twitter, that they basically really don't follow anyone and they don't have any followers really, but and they're they retweeting a lot at a high rapid, rapid rate. Um, things like deep fakes, one of the things when I first saw this, of course the first time I saw it, I really thought it was Obama and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but when you watch it again, you'll notice he doesn't really blink. So it's little things like that you have to be, be woke about. Right. And you know, it really does take a sophisticated eye. You know, we're, these are going to become better and better and better as the technology gets better and better and better. So some things you wanna keep in mind is that in, on Facebook, there are things called fake friends. Now, how many of you guys have ever gotten like a friend invite for somebody you don't know? Right. Okay, right, a lot of you. So the point behind those are, are maybe not to spread misinformation, but to gain access to yours. Once they have access to your information, your preferences, and your friends, they can use it for marketing purposes, targeting purposes, as well as selling mis or and, sending misinformation. And not just that, on social media. Have you ever taken that quiz, what kind of potato are you? Like what pizza Russell. topping I would be? Don't do it, because they're also mining your information once you take those, so be vi don't even click on it. Yeah, as, as interesting as it is, like, by the way, I'm a French fry. But anyway, <laughs> don't take those quizzes. <laughs> um, so as we said before, bots are essentially there to spread or popularize certain accounts over others, certain hashtags over others. Deep fakes now are, as we said, artificial intelligence used to manipulate video as well as audio. One of the things we looked into um, when trying to deep fake President Douglas was um, using clips of her voice. And so it wouldn't even have to be having a video. We could just get, and if we had enough of her audio data, we could eventually make her say that we were Susan the best and Emily are the best librarians ever. Which is now a goal for me. <laughs> So we have a little activity that we'd like you to do. You can either work with a partner or do this by yourself. This, you know, misinformation isn't just about political memes or that newspaper story. It actually is visual too. 
So this picture was posted on um, Imgur. Imgur. I always want to say Imgur. And it reads, on March 11, 2011, there was a large nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. This image was posted on Imgur, a photo sharing website in July 2015. The caption, which we cropped off, sorry, says, not much more to say. This is what happens when flowers get nuclear birth defects. So I'd like you to take a minute, and I want you, does this post provide strong enough evidence about the conditions near the power plant? And I want you to explain your reasoning. So just take about a minute, and then we'll ask the audience what you came up with. How would you say, if, if does this picture have a strong enough evidence? All right. So typically when I do this in a class, <clears throat> I actually, we, I ask the students, well, we'll get to that. What, what do you think, I'm like, what were some clues, like, does this picture give you strong enough evidence that this is a result of the nuclear meltdown? Yes. Um, why do you think? Well, because of the first power. That doesn't show much damage in the first power. It's kind of way to explain. It's out of tie the flowers. None of the flowers are getting damaged. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's not as, it looks like Photoshopped. So it could it be Photoshopped, good. right. So we don't know if this picture's been Photoshopped. That's great. Anything else? Yes. I don't, yes, there's nothing there in context that shows we're near a nuclear power plant. Anything else? Yes, way in the back. <laughs> One of the things we talk about as librarians here is authority. Who's behind the information? We don't know who it is. Right? We don't know who posted this. Excellent. Anything else? Yep. You guys give me hope. <laughs> so when I do this in a classroom, I always talk to the students like, how could we fact check this? So where would, how would we fact check this? Where do we start? Yes. Click on the profile that posted it. Yes. What else could we do? Yes. Looking at the topic and maybe looking at a more reliable source. Right. So let, I always say, let's go to Google, right? So we talk about keyword searching. So the keyword searching here would be like nuclear plant, Fukushima, daisies. So when I did this in a classroom, it was a, I think it was a, a British newspaper that pulled up and it actually said, yes, this is like a result of the nuclear um, power plant, like everything's getting like all warped with the, the radiation. Um, but what we do is when you look at that newspaper source, I then want you to go to this, go to Google again and do the name of the newspaper and put in bias. It's going to bring you to a website called mediabias.com and this paper leaned heavily to the right and was, no, and was known to post inaccurate information. So we went back and did the Google search again and we ended up finding a National Geographic. Have you heard of National Geographic? Right, valid source, right? We also saw Scientific American and they both said that the scientists said this is inconclusive because they've seen a mutation in this type of daisy without it even being near a nuclear power plant. You could also go to Snopes. Snopes actually had something on it as well as PolitiFact, too. You guys are good. The second one we handed it out. Did everybody get a chance to kind of look that over? Why don't you just take a second to skim it? So one of the things on social media that I've seen that I've actually done um, is fallen for the headlines without actually reading the journal article. Like, I, I did it. I shared. I, I forget what star it was, but I was all upset they died, and then someone pointed out they died like five years ago. <laughs> so what about this headline might grab your attention? Right. So yeah, this happened to me. I read this headline, Florida schoolboy arrested after refusing to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. My first reaction was, that's BS. Um, in 1943, the courts ruled that you could not make a citizen stand for the um, Pledge of Allegiance. 1943, what was going on during the 40s? 
World War II, right? So under Hitler, it was a state where you just did what he said, you stood what he said, you recited what he said, hi Hitler, right? The United States didn't want to follow that. So it fell under freedom of speech. So my first reaction was, they can't do that. They can't arrest a kid for not saying that. I was outraged. And then you read the article, right? In the article, it states that he wasn't arrested for refusing to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. He was arrested because he started acting out to the police officers. Now, I don't agree with anything that happened in here. The headline is very misleading. Does anybody know what that's called when the headline says something different? Yes, it's clickbait, right? So people were sharing this, outraged that, you know, this student was arrested or, or either they were saying he should have been arrested, da, 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 without even reading the article. So one of the things we hope, one thing that you take away is before you share anything, you fact check it or actually read it. And especially look at the date, because that's something a lot of people fall for. They'll share stuff not realizing that it was published two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. So we keep saying these two organizations of PolitiFact and Snopes, but they can be your best friend, especially in the modern information era where there is so much false information. What I like about these is it's not just a true false, like you go to the, the website PolitiFact or Snopes, and there's a lengthy discussion. With their resources. Right, and so they, they talk about where they found out what was real or what wasn't, or when there's a partial truth and when there isn't. Because one of the reasons misinformation works so well is that it does have a grain of truth to it. That's what makes it easy to share. And the other one I talk about a lot is mediabias.com. So again, if you're reading something in a newspaper, automatically do like The Atlantic Bias in Google, and it will bring you to Media Bias, and they'll show you, there's like an arrow, and it shows you on the spectrum where it lands, and then it tells you how accurate their fact checking is, and they back it up with all their resources. So, I just click here, just watch this quick little video. What I do? Well, what I do? Well. Welcome to the brave new world of social media, where most of us get our news and political information. The upside is, we get to participate in this conversation as never before. We comment, we share, we tweet, we retweet. But our favorite social networks have also amped up the power of the opinionators. Sometimes this activates us. And sometimes it feeds us distortion. It's just a stupid opinion. I mean, it's, 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 it's a misunderstanding. Name my name is Juana Summers, and I'm an editor for CNN Politics based in Washington, D.C. One of the great things and one of the horrible things about social media is that everybody can have their say. It's kind of a marketplace of ideas, and some voices that sometimes are not correct or have a very partisan slant can oftentimes get amplified. It wasn't always this way. With Trayvon Martin's killing in 2012 by George Zimmerman, we saw a new pattern of coverage emerge. Trayvon's death became a meme that led to an agenda war on social media and a now familiar shouting match on cable television with wildly diverging narratives based on where you turn or click. Jim Rutenberg, media columnist of the New York Times. We are in a whole new world where Twitter, Facebook, and social media are driving coverage nationwide. So CNN, Fox, MSNBC is going to pick one side and if enough people like the way it sounds, and want to believe it, it's off to the races. The wheels are in motion for a complete character assassination of Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin behaving in a thuggish manner, assaulting George Zimmerman. Thug. How about the guy who chased down the 17-year-old and shot him in the chest? What we want when we're covering race is some kind of national conversation that leads us somewhere good. But if you're only going with the divided take, us against them, right against left, it's hard to see us coming to some place of reconciliation. Now that we can program our own news diet online, it's even easier to seek out what we want to believe. The irony is 
said instead of expanding our worldview, social networks can easily become accomplices and shrink it. Andrew Gladstone, the co-host and managing editor of On the Media, a national program produced by Betty Wimley. There is a tendency in digital media for a heightened phenomenon to occur. Incestuous and That's your word for the day. That's your word for the day. Facebook's main goal is to keep you on its site. Its algorithm is set up to give you what you want. An algorithm is a formula that Facebook engineers have put together to maybe even know what you like before you know what you like. If you don't relish the idea of a computer algorithm responding to your likes and dislikes, you have to figure out how to curate your news for yourself. Suddenly, the news choices that you make will help determine your view of an event of the world. Even more important, your view of the world determines what your news choices are. It really begins with you. So the question is, what do you do? I would love it if I could tell every person in America, if you read something you violently disagree with once a day. If you're a diehard MSNBC watcher, go turn on Fox. If you love to read Breitbart and Town Hall, go listen to NPR for a day. Maybe there's something there for you to challenge your assumptions and the things you typically read. You can employ deputy curators. On Twitter, say, you find people who are experts in the areas that you care about going beyond the usual suspects and actually clicking further distances than you normally do. If you're just swiping through your Facebook or your Twitter, go past the headline or the image that you're seeing and ask what's the full story, what's the source of the information, and just being really critical of that. Today, it only takes a minute to Google something you see online and find out if it's been updated or fact-checked. Don't reflexively retweet. You are feeding back into the system that is feeding into you. You're a part of this now. The great news about the advent of social media is that there's more information at your fingertips. You can take advantage of that, and you can be the best informed citizen in history. In the digital age, everyone with a keyboard can be a creator or distributor of content. We have more power than ever, and with that comes responsibility. It's on us to be our own media keepers and to engage thoughtfully in the evolving landscape of digital democracy. So we had asked you when you came in to see where you fall. Right? So this is what we call an echo chamber, particularly in social media. Anytime on Facebook, you see those Facebook pages we had shown you earlier, like Blacktivists and the, the Southern Confederate and the Blue Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter. Every time you like that or you comment, Facebook's algorithm picks that up. So if you're constantly clicking and sharing far right or conservative stuff, that's all you're gonna get fed. Same thing if you're far left, you're all gonna get fed that. As a matter of fact. Well, and I just yeah. wanna point out that I think knowing your own bias is one of the best things you can do. If you know where you fall on the political spectrum, then you can kind of fight the echo chamber that you have constructed and that other algorithms have constructed for you. When Susan and I started doing these classes, I realized that I am definitely over here on the left side. I realized I was reading Mother Jones, that I was reading all of these very leftist organizations because they gave me the kinds of information that I wanted to see through the lens that I wanted to see. And when I started realizing that, I went out there and I curated my own news. And before you leave today, if you can, open up your social media and follow two specific news organizations. That is the AP or the Associated Press and I'm blanking. Reuters. Right? So those two are the most unbiased news sources. They don't interpret it for you. They don't tell you what they think about it. They report the news. They say this happened at this time in this location. And again, media bias. Like I looked, because I found I was reading a lot of The Hill in the Atlantic, and thankfully they actually are right in the middle and they're accurate in the fact check. So if you are reading something, make sure you go and you're checking where it falls on the political spectrum. Um, this came out 
what you're seeing here is from uh, Yale University. And they wanted, it's actually a website that they've archived, but they curated these pictures on the same topic. So you can go into this website and click on Trump. This one's on guns. And it shows you what happened when they took two, they created two profiles. One was liberal, one was conservative, and they made sure to like. And what they saw was exactly what we were just talking about. You're just getting fed through that algorithm what Facebook wants you to see. So a lot of times we tend to think that these things happen online and that it's removed from us and that there aren't as many real world implications to fake news. Um, in India in 2018, there was a incident where people felt that there were kidnappers roaming through the streets and taking children. And so what happened was people would share these videos on WhatsApp. Okay, so on WhatsApp, these videos started spreading because what happens when you feel your child might be in danger? What would you do? You'd share it. I would. So what I want to do is scroll down till I get to the video. So this is a, is a doctored video that originally was a Pakistani um, PSA or uh, public service announcement. It was edited and then spread on WhatsApp. And what happened was this ended in the actual murder of people who were on a pilgrimage in India. Innocent people. Innocent people. Um, because there was this fear that, that they were going to take their children. Right? So this misinformation that started online led to the actual murder of people in real life. But that would never happen here in the United States. You guys know where this is going, right? So of course it would. So in 2016, um, Edgar Madison Welch walked into the Comet Pizzeria in Washington, DC with an AR-15, a 38 handgun, and a folding knife because he was convinced that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta were running a child pe uh, pedophile ring out of the basement of this particular Comet Pizzeria. Right. So he walked in with a gun and shot it and found no children. Right, because it was a piece of information that he read online. And then we have some more serious consequences where people find themselves to be radicalized online. And in this case, um, Robert Bowers took a AR-15 into the synagogue of the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and killed 12 people. He was radicalized essentially online by reading hateful, bigoted, anti-Semitic information on different social media platforms. He found like-minded people online that he was able to converse with, shares idea, ideas with. His right? own echo chamber. Right, exactly. So these things that happen online have real world consequences. What we've seen in the last number of years is a rise in anti-Semitic crimes as well as hate crimes. So in the last single year, anti-Semitic incidents rose 60% in a single year. In 2009, um, the, what is it, DHS, I'm talking about my acronyms, Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security came out with a report that said that after Obama was elected, they saw an increase in white supremacist activity because most of them were outraged that a president that had been elected was black. Um, and then we see another uptick, uptick under this administration because as we all know from Trump, there are fine people on both sides. And this is a local thing, right? So according to the Anti-Defamation League, in 2018 there were 144 anti-Semitic incidents in Massachusetts alone. One of them happened right here in Fall River. Fall River, New Bedford. Right, when uh, Jewish cemeteries were targeted, right? So now we want to talk about self-radicalization. We've kind of left the world of, you know, memes, funny things, fake news, and now we're going to talk about real-world self-radicalization. So self-radicalization is essentially that um, you read uh, radical literature and become radicalized. Here is a brief timeline. So Timothy McVeigh in 1995 killed 168 people in the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. He was radicalized by reading a racist novel called The Turner Diaries. 
Then in 2008, we have Jim Atkinson, who felt that liberals were the ones who kept him from succeeding in life, so he walked into a universalist Unitarian church and killed two people. In 2009, Nadal Hassan responded to the death of his parents by becoming increasingly radicalized through um, his interpretations of the Quran, and he killed um, 13 people at Fort Hood. In 2015, Dylan Roof consumed massive amounts of right-wing, um, extreme right-wing literature, and he killed nine people at the um, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, the Turner Diaries were something we wanted to mention briefly because these were published in the 70s. How many of you remember the Oklahoma City bombing? Okay, so those of you who don't, this was a huge event, right? It was one of these massive, um, one of the worst terrorist attacks that had it happened in our country. And one of the things that had happened was we started to see this string of people who were using the Turner Diaries to actually self-radicalize. So we have the men who, dra who dra drug James Byrd Jr. to death um, they had read the Turner Diaries. Then we have Fraser Glenn Miller who walked into a Jewish community center in Kansas and had read the Turner Diaries. And then something a little bit more close to home, we have um, Jason Robida who walked into Puzzles, which was a gay nightclub in New Bedford and stabbed three people. He had a, he had a shotgun and he had a hatchet and he killed three people. And he had the Turner Diaries. Right. And this is interesting because one of the things in the Department of Homeland Security, they said that typically, prior to like 2009, 2010, it took like, I don't know, five to six years for people to self-radicalize because a lot of them were doing it this way via print versus after like 2011 particularly, it only takes eight to nine months to radicalize because there's so much information online, particularly um, the next person we're coming to. Oops. Um, Lewis Beam, he is um, heavily involved, was heavily involved in the Ku Klux Klan and he actually was um, arrested for trying to overthrow the government. And um, it was him and about six other white men who the, the case held in the South, I believe, it, I want to see Tennessee. But um, basically, he was acquitted by an all-white jury. But then it made him think he went back and revisited something he had written in uh, 1983. And it's actually... Um, uh, what was it called? Leaderless, Leaderless resistance. resistance. And what he says is that we can't have big organizations anymore like the Ku Klux Klan. It draws too much attention. So what you need to do is just be no more than one or two people, right? And that way, no one can really track your movement. You don't have about 50 people who knows all the information. And by doing this, these cells like, you can go in, create havoc, and be in and out. And so this is a strategy that ISIS has followed, as well as many extreme terrorists in this country. So the lone wolf style of attack is vastly more likely to be successful than the kind that was once planned in a room full of mm -hmm. men. This is a very interesting report. Um, this was done by the Southern Poverty Law Center in its data from April 1st, 2009 to February 1st, 2015. And in it, it talks about that 2009 report from um, the Department of Homeland Security, where basically Department of Homeland Security was squashed, the report was squashed, uh, specifically from Republicans. John Bo I can't say his Boehner. name. Boehner, thank you, Republican Ohio, described this DHS report as offensive and unacceptable, and that these lone wolves are just American citizens who disagree with the direction Washington Democrats are taking our nation. So then they started to strip funding for d d the Homeland Security, still insisting that we had to fear Muslims from other countries and Mexicans in the south of our border. So what we see here is a breakdown of lone wolf incidents. 51% are based on hate and 49% are based on anti-government sentiment. 74% um, of these attacks were lone wolf or singular um, offenders as opposed to 26% that were group offenders. Now as Susan mentioned, the DHS has stripped organizations that research right-wing extremism um, and has essentially taken money away from their ability to fight and combat this type of extremism. Now, when we were doing this research, these people, while we call them extreme right wing, do not identify with typical conservatives. They do not do that. So if that is something that you have in your mind, that's not what these people think. They disavow, or disavow conservatives as being weak and not strong enough. 
So there are some behavioral indicators of self-radicalization. I know we're kind of running out of time, so I don't want to spend too, too much on this, but your searching behavior changes, right? They start to realize that there's something out there that maybe they didn't realize before, and they start searching for it. They express disillusionment, and they uh, seek alternative pieces of information. Then they detach, right? They start to proselytize their radical views, and they pick fights with different community members. Then their peer immersion, they start spending time with their ideological peers, and then they plan or execute violence. So self-radicalization is multifaceted. As we mentioned, this isn't one ideology over another. You have here some of the biggest um, massacres that have happened both in this country and outside based on very different ideology. So we have anti-Semitic ideology, which was the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. We have the Pulse nightclub in Florida, which was homophobic. We have misogynistic, which was a young man who decided that because women wouldn't sleep with him, he was going to kill as many sorority girls yep. as he wanted. That group is called incel? Yeah, it's an incel group. Um, so they, he went out in, I think it was Santa Barbara, and tried to kill as many people as he could. And then, of course, we have the Islamophobic attacks in Christchurch. So here we have um, one, one of the guys who may have started as all, hit this all. His name is Saint, well, not really. They are, he is referred to as Saint Brevik. By white supremacists. And yeah. he murdered 77 people in Norway in 2011. And what happened was he was so disillusioned with the way the government was being held that he wrote a 1,500 page manifesto. It's crazy. And it starts off how he hates Muslims. He women. doesn't like feminism because women get ideas in their head that they don't want to have children and that that's what our main function is to is to increase the white race so we're not breeding. Um, he higher does ed. not like higher ed, education. He particularly dislikes sociology. He doesn't think sociology should be taught in the schools. Sociology is the study of cultures, right? right. So this particular manifesto, while being one of the most prolific, was also one of the most ideological um, impactful. So murderers from Christchurch to Charlestown to Sandy Hook all used Brevik as inspiration. So in some cases, they quoted this guy and talked to him, or talked about what he did, his kill rate, and all of these things as being a major influencer when they went out and did these. And, and just an aside, too, we read this. We didn't read every we single page, but we did go through it all. And sandwiched in the middle of all the hate and his, and, and, and it's interesting because he's citing all these sources, which of course are in his own echo chamber, all far right ideologicals. But in the middle of it, tells you about, gives you explicit directions on how to shoot people up, what kind of guns you should use, what kind armor. of bullets, what kind of armor you should use. There's links to like sites to that bring you. Bomb. And then he says, if, you know, and don't worry, if you're in an area where you can't get guns, I'm gonna tell you how to build a fertilizer bomb. Matter of fact, if you can't get fertilizer, I'm gonna show you how you can grow beets, that you can make your own fertilizer. So this becomes a lone wolf terrorist handbook. Right. And you know we're not going to tell you how, but it was relatively easy to find. One of these, th another things that these manifestos do is they do a, what's called a call to action, right? So here we have three murderers who essentially wrote their ma in their manifestos and included information about going forward and continuing the crusade. So Britton Tarrant, who was Christchurch, said, don't run from the fight, run towards the fight. If they could die, so can you. Expect death, expect struggle, typo. Expect loss that you will never forget. Don't expect to survive. Then we have Jim Adkinson who said, I'd like to encourage other like-minded people to do what I've done, go kill liberals. And then finally, John Ernest, who was the murderer in El Paso, Texas, said to my brothers in blood, make sure my sacrifices were n was not in vain, spread this letter. So the extreme right has figured out how to capitalize on memes, okay? So memes have become, as we said before, a major way to express your political ideology. And this has become something that the far right does extremely well. So here we have hospitals are filling since Gritty's red pilling. And red pilling is a um, term that refers to the matrix where they suddenly see the truth, right? The people who are on these far right boards are the ones who see the world as it really is. Now the quote that's here 
is actually from one of the murderer's manifestos, and he says, create memes, post memes, and spread memes. Memes have done more for the ethno-nationalist movement than any manifesto. Yeah, so one of the memes, this was Pepe the Frog was actually uh, created by a children's illustrator and the, the um, Nash white nationalists have co-opted it and they used it for its own purposes. The author, uh, author tried to squelch it in vain and endly, uh, ended up killing off his character, which in turn gave them free reign to utilize this image. Um, the websites that you see, 4chan and 8chan, um, those were created... Um, uh, specifically targeted towards white supremacist groups, incel, right? Incel are pe men, young men who are just unhappy with women overall, and then we have Reddit. So this is the things that keep getting um, retooled and spread. Right. And so the meme you see here is anti-Semitic. So what I wanted to do was, we have just a few more slides to show you, but I wanted to leave you with a quote so this was a joint statement from the Department of Justice, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the National Security Agency. This just came out. This was just published within the last month. Our adversaries want to undermine our democratic institutions, influence public sentiment, and affect government policies. Russia, China, Iran, and other foreign malicious actors will seek to interfere in the, in the voting process or influence voter perceptions. Adversaries may try to accomplish their goals through a variety of memes. memes including social media campaigns, directing disinformation operations, or conducting disruptive or destructive cyber attacks on state and local infrastructure. So remember when I said they hacked into Ukraine's infrastructure and caused blackouts? I think this is a bit of an acknowledgement that they can get into our infrastructure as well. So um, I just want to show, if you click on the LibGuide, we did create here at Bristol Community College, we have a LibGuide that we call it that is all about fake news. You can go to the different tabs, deep fakes, how to spot a bot. I have some fact checking websites out there, how to evaluate information. So please feel free to lose that. Mm -hmm. um, anybody have any questions for Emily and I? Oh, yes. Any questions? Yes, in the back, young sir. So, to what extent is there a controversy in some of the large democracies kind of uh, start to form such as the media and people usually have 500 million voters at each of their elections, and they have access, like us, to some of the most information we've ever gotten. Like, can we walk us into the levels and say that the office is better at all the information that we're in? It begins with you. It begins with you, and that's why we're doing this workshop. Because if you're savvy enough, you know, when I talked about the thing with the G at GOP, right, and then you had followers who had millions of followers and they're all spreading in misinformation, it really begins with you guys to start being savvy and as we say, curate your own news feed and make sure that you're reading both sides of the coin and you're making um, thoughtful decisions, particularly when spreading information. Does anybody else have any questions? Way in the back. No. I have, honestly, I have two 14-year-olds, and I'm in love with them. Yeah, so academic librarians, we don't really go out into the um, public high schools, but it would be something we definitely would consider. I mean, I think it's very important. Anybody else? Any questions for Emily or I? So what were the news organizations we want you to follow before you leave today? AP and Reuters. Do yourself the favor, because as the next election cycle heats up, you're going to see more and more misinformation. And so if you're following the AP and you're following Reuters, then you will have the best information possible. Now, um, my colleague, Shelly Murphy, actually did some research uh, on fake news, but more from a journalistics point of view. And she went to what's called the museum in Washington, D.C., and she has some fabulous bookmarks that we're going to hand to you as you guys walk out. They're wonderful. Um, sorry, I forgot the mic. Um, they're wonderful, really good. Like, you can keep them just on you so that you can kind of remind yourself the importance of telling real information from false. All right? Any other questions? Be woke, bitches. Be woke. Stay woke, bitches.